Is this the, oh, it's lunchtime, I'm going to go to sleep? This is not the sleep room. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Welcome to Database Lifecycle Management and the SQL Server Database. My name is Brian Randall. I'm a partner with MCW Technologies. Welcome to Tech Days Netherlands 2017. Slide about me, you can read later. Uh, key things, email address, Twitter handle is the best way to get a hold of me, so follow me on Twitter. I tweet occasionally, so I won't fill your feed, and I tend to stick to work-related topics if that matters to you. Um, so let's get right into it. So database lifecycle management, hmm, maybe you've heard of application lifecycle management. In the last 10 years, we've been working on moving application development to a broader spectrum and thinking about it in a larger picture. If you think about development at the core, we've often focused on the software development life cycle. Things like continuous integration, unit testing. And when we think about that in the small, we've seen significant improvements with the advent and adoption of agile development technologies, whether it's big A, agile, Robin sandals, very hardcore, to the more loosey, we do scrum, but okay, fine. The bottom line is we have made improvements as developers. So if you consider yourself a developer, you should pat yourself on the back. Am I, am I dancing something wrong? Mm. <laughs> That's all we do in the US. All good? Yep. All right. With application lifecycle management, we started wanting to think of things a little more holistically. We thought about operations, how they took care of the application once it's out in production. And then governance was this notion of how are we going to pay for it. In addition, sometimes software projects are not the, the, the primary item. Uh, my go-to example is aircraft. So being over here in Europe, Airbus, right? Airbus um, you know, made a splash by building the biggest passenger jet in the world with the Airbus A380. That plane will not fly without software, right? So software is a critical component, but it's not the only thing. In fact, probably largely from a cost standpoint, while it is measurable, it is not the primary cost, right? It's going to be materials and probably a lot of the physical labor of both factories and manufacturing. So those are things that often developers don't care about. But all these things matter when we think about software, and it's going to affect the database. So the idea is this, what if we apply the lessons learned in ALM, but focused on the database, which is often critical to how we do things, but not often managed with the same level of rigor. So the Redgate folks, in fact, really started saying, how can we make this better with what they do, both from a free community effort. They offer guidance, articles, and even free tooling, but also they have ways to make it better. And so they said, maybe we do DLM, database lifecycle management. And the idea was go from this manual mechanism that we often have to a more structured format using source control, continuous integration, and release management, and have end-to-end -end monitoring and analytics. No talk about lifecycle management would be complete without talking about the big D word, DevOps. And we think about DevOps, Donovan Brown has really codified that into a simple term. At the end of the day, no matter what you take away from this talk and any other talk here at Tech Day around DevOps, is that it starts with you. You are the most important factor in the success or failure of DevOps. DevOps is an organizational transformation that starts with you and how you build your software solutions. After that, tools can help you. Tools can make your life better. But they are not where you start. You do not buy DevOps in, DevOps in a box any more than you buy Agile in a box. All right? So understand that that's the critical aspect. Now, right now, I could then go for the next couple hours and talk about organizational transformations and everything else, but this is a 400-level talk. I assume you know this and that you've bought into it. So we're going to jump right into the tactical issues of the mechanics on how do I go from having this database that is managed maybe with an iron fist by Dieter the DBA, right, and bring it into the 2000s with proper lifecycle management. At the end of the day, it's always... a a game of letters, and today's letter is the letter C. C stands for continuous. And we think about continuous, we think about how we're going to bring database management into the future by focusing on the flow. What we're trying to do is change the experience on how we manage database change and basically take the shift left mentality and get, get it to the developer. 
So it's going to start with continuous integration. If you don't know what it is, go home. I'm sorry, it's 2017, and we're in Europe too. If we're in the United States and we're in certain states, I might cut you some slack because the education system might not be as good. <laughs> I can insult my own people, I think. Uh, and I live in California, so that's, that's part of my job. Um, but the fundamental issue is that we want to be able to take this notion of making changes to the database and analyzing it with the same rigor. So that means we're going to have automated build processes. We're going to run validation tests against our changes. The next step is continuous testing. Once again, shift left. We're not going to wait for our users to find problems with our database changes. We want to find them sooner, whenever possible, at the individual level of the developer, at the shared dev environment level, maybe a formal test environment, maybe user acceptance testing. And obviously, we, if we find something in prod, we want to learn from it and fix it for the next time. Continuous deployment. Right? We want to have the ability to deploy database changes on demand as needed. Right? Our goal as developers is to reduce lead time. The amount of time it takes for a user to dream of a feature, a wish, and actually be able to use that. That's what it's all about, reducing lead time. But you can't go super fast if you don't do it safely. Right? It's like walking around here in Amsterdam. You gotta just watch really carefully before you cross the road or you get run over by the bicyclist. Right? Although I was taught a great technique that I'll share later tonight over beers if anyone wants to learn. I learned how to survive this. But fundamentally, we want to go as fast as possible as long as it's safe, right? And it's by having those previous two things, integration and testing, where we're going to inspire confidence both in our operations brethren as well as in our customers that we can move more aggressively so we can raise the speed limit. And then it's all about continuous feedback, knowing how we're doing, both through automated monitoring as well as taking direct feedback from our customers. At the end, this drives us towards this path of continuous improvement. We can always do it better. Never accept, well, that's the way we do it around here, or that's the way we have done it. And databases are one of the most common places you'll find that. D to the DBA will not let you near the database because I've been doing it for 20 years and I will not let you mess up my database, right? A little bit of Arnold Schwarzenegger thrown in there. <laughs> he is my governor. What can I do, right? And in the end, this is all about continuous delivery. When I think about deployment versus delivery, deployment is more the mechanical process, the automation. Delivery is the larger scale process of reducing lead time, delivering value. And at the end of the day, going back to Donovan's definition, right, we're delivering value to our users, our customers, right? We want to identify with end users, right? No one likes getting an app update on their phone and having to brick their phone, right? Or an app stop working, right? So we put ourselves in the same mindset as our customers. Now, how are you going to do this? Well, we're going to build an end-to-end -end pipeline. And we're going to do this by being able to manage change in a database just like we would any other piece of software. In other words, we're going to use things like version control. We're going to use automated build processes. And we're going to have a continuous delivery pipeline that allows us to take a commit and assume it passes all the tests. It can go all the way to broad without any human intervention. Now, sometimes databases are where people get a little freaked out. So they might want a little validation point before they actually let it loose on prod. And that's fine. We can do that, and I'll show you that. What we want to do is reduce to a minimum the chances of human failure. Understand you will screw up. Guaranteed. But it's not that you screwed up, it's that you're able to detect it as soon as possible, right? So you want to get your mean time to detection down, and you want your mean time to repair to be as short as possible. And I'm going to show you how by using just a little bit of work item management on top of VSTS or TFS, how you can do that, where you can easily micromanage those changes. Now, from a mechanical standpoint, this is where tools can help, right? The days of going to SQL Server, right-clicking, exporting your database, def you know, your catalog definition as a bunch of .SQL files, and then putting it in a zip folder, and then put in a folder with a date, like, please, don't do that, right? We have modern tools available to the DBA and the developer, so we're going to use them. We're going to use SQL Server's uh, data tools, aka SSDT. We're also going to use Microsoft Release Management, both through VSTS and with Team Foundation Server. 
Specifically, I'm using Team Foundation Server 2017 Update 2, which is the current shipping released version. I'm going to be using SQL Server 2006 SP1 Cumulative Update 5, and I'm going to be using uh, SQL Database up in Azure. Tools from Redgate, um, I'm not going to explicitly use them. I'm going to show you just what kind of basically what's available for free. But I highly recommend, if you are going to get serious about this, that you look at what Redgate has to offer. They have a few free tools, but they also have some exceptionally valuable tools that are worth every penny to really take you to the next level, eliminate some of the pain and the mechanics. I really get frustrated when I find developers writing tools for their automation pipeline when they don't have to. Right? Your job is to deliver value to your customers. Now, if your customer is someone like Redgate, great. But my guess is if I go ask your users, do you care that your team just spent a week writing an automated you know, extra scripting thing because they didn't want to go buy one from a vendor? and you didn't get any new value, right? You working on tooling doesn't deliver value. You working on the application your users use is where the value comes in. All right. Now, when we think about working with databases, there's a couple ways we do this. And one is to use a model approach. What we're going to do is we're going to use SSDT to walk up to a database, and it's going to basically talk to it. It's going to tickle it. It's going to tell me all your secrets. And it's going to express those secrets in the form of a model that it takes offline. It's basically known as a state model. Often what happens here is the source of the truth for a database definition is not some book on a shelf, not some entity diagram. It's what? Production. Right? Production is your source of the truth. Now this is where if you have a Dieter that you want to make peace, bring Dieter some chocolate, some fudge, some beer, whatever Dieter likes, and say, we would like to look at the production database, and get its secrets. We want to understand the structure of the database. We're going to bring it offline, and then we're going to model it as a set of data definition entities. Dot SQL files that are expressed as standard SQL that can then be version controlled, managed, diffed, just like you would a C sharp file, a .vb file, C++, whatever. Then we're going to publish our changes using what's known as a DAC pack. Now, you can also use .sql files, but using a DAC pack allows us to package up the entire database so if the target is empty, in other words, database doesn't exist, we can recreate the entire database, or using diffgram technology, we can look at the differences between the source, the target, and the, sorry, the source and the target database and only make the changes as necessary. And by default, we'll block if any of the changes would cause data, cause data loss. I'm going to cover some of the more advanced issues uh, once we get through the pipeline that you might run into. With SSDT, you have the opportunity to run pre- and post-deployment scripts. Those are ways that you can do check for data motion issues, uh, rules, etc. In addition, you can use post as a way to load your sample data, etc. And I'll cover that some more in a bit. Now, there is another approach that some of the young kids like. Um, how many people know what third normal form means? Third normal form. Okay, you're my kind of crowd. I love you all. Let's go drink together. Um, those who did not raise your hand, go home. I don't like you. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm old. I've got some gray hair. I grew up learning about relational theory and understanding how to design an application by starting at the database. I definitely am a database first type of person. Now, there's these younger people out there um, that like to program in these funky languages. Um, we won't name them. But often what they do is they say, you know what, the database, just persistence. Can I just have my objects and just have it magically save off? And they often buy into things like that, ORMs, object relational mappers. Um, and EF Core is a good example, um, where you'll model your data using C Sharp classes, for example. And then through this framework plumbing, they will go and generate the database for you. When you go to make changes, they will define what's known as a migration. And that migration will then be how you make changes to the database. Now, my biggest frustration with EF is that it's been catching up and constantly changing, creates friction. Um, in addition, it often twists the responsibility for understanding the complexity of the database. It's great for file new projects, Greenfield, where you're just starting from scratch. Um, you can do rapid iterations and eliminate some of the complexity of managing a database. So it, it can work. 
But once again, I find if you have gone to the process of spending money on a rich version of SQL Server like Enterprise Edition, and all you're doing is using it for basically table storage, you're really wasting your money, right? The power of, of, of SQL Server is the engine, the ability to have programmable objects, and the smart processing technology, et cetera, right? And then obviously like new versions like uh, Hackathon and all the other features we have, the column store, right? There's lots of power in there. So that's my biggest problem with this. I'm not saying it's bad or wrong. I'm just saying if I give them the approach, I prefer the state model. Um, in addition, uh, Redgate has a tool called ReadyRoll that uses a similar approach um, that is a very nice way of doing it. Once again, uh, you can look at that. What's great about ReadyRoll now is it is a commercial product you have to buy, but they do have a core edition that now ships as part of Visual Studio 2017 Enterprise Edition. So you can try it basically friction free, then it has a lot of the core features, and then if you want, of course, Redgate's happy to take some of your money to upgrade. All right, fantastic. We've got a couple more slides at the end, but at this point, let's go and demo. And my hope is that it's as simple as coming to Visual Studio, coming over here, opening up my solution. And while we do that, let's go over here and get zoom it. Okay, as I mentioned, I'm using uh, Visual Studio 2017, uh, specifically build 15.3. Uh, 15.4 came out this week. I chose not to take the risk and install that last night, especially over hotel Wi-Fi. Now, you'll note over here, I have two projects, okay? Now, what we're going to do here is I'm going to go kind of in reverse. I've got everything set up, and then we'll walk backwards to how I made this work, okay? But what you'll note is I have this top project, which, if we expand it, looks like I've gone up to a database and said, tell me about yourself. And I went back in time to a place of my youth, the Northwind database. It just feels so warm and fuzzy, okay? Now, what you'll note is I also have a test project here. And this test project is using the test framework, uh, MS Test, with additional tests that are designed to work with programmable objects in SQL Server. Most notably, store procedures, table value functions, and uh, I'm missing one. Um, that doesn't matter. The point is the programmable objects. In addition, you can write custom enhancements using C Sharp if you want. But regardless, what I want to do is make a change, and one of the common things you want to do is you want to enhance the table. Now, the nice thing when to use the data tools is I can open this up and note right away that this is marked with a padlock glyph, which means it's under version control. Okay? Now, I can look at this table and go, okay, I'd like to like, add a new field. And how about Euro VIP? We'll change this to be a bit, and we're going to allow nulls because we're adding a new column. Now, notice what happened there. I have the choice. I can live the code lifestyle, or I can use the visual tools. The key is that what I'm persisting to the system is going to be a .sql file that can be differenced. So we're going to save this. And then that means I can use tools like version control. I can go, come over here and compare it to the previous version, right? Just like you would a C-sharp file. So we get that nice ability to know what changed. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want anybody messing with the database without a reason. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to keep this under version control, and in this case, I'm using Team Foundation Server. And in Team Foundation Server, I have a project, and we're going to go over here to the Work Hub. And in the Work Hub, I can define my backlog, which represents my users' wishes, their dreams, the things they want me to do. And I've got one right here, work on DLM for our database. I'm going to put this task in progress, and we'll go back over here. I'm going to take my changes. And we're going to say add Euro VIP field to customers table. I'm going to add that work item which I believe was 43. And for this example, I'm using TFVC. Of course, I can use Git with uh, the version VSTS. I'll use Git. And I'll check it in. Now, what's going to happen here, when I check this in, 
I come over here to the Builds Hub, in a second, there we go. We see I have a build in progress. So it's going to go up to the agent, and it's going to go and build the database. So what's it going to do? Well, it's going to, with the SSDT project, it has a semantic engine that understands what a .SQL file should look like. Right, so it understands the notion of what a create table statement should look like, what an alter statement should look like, et cetera. And boy, the power of SSDs, build's done. Um, before I can even finish talking about it. <laughs> um, so did a build, and if we take a look at the report, it also ran my unit tests. Okay, I just have one in here for simplicity's sake. But the point is, just like you can with your C-sharp code, you can build that quality muscle by having unit tests. Right? and looking for regressions in your code. Now, the next step is release. Well, if we come over here to the release hub, you'll see I have a release in progress, and you'll note I've got three environments. So my dev environment's already been deployed to, and right now it's deploying to test. Test is done. Well, how do I know what these environments are? Well, if we open this up, you'll see that I have dev, test, and prod. Now, you notice right there, it's not deployed to prod because I put it in a reprover step. I said someone needs to approve this, and if we hover, come on, baby, send back. You love me, come on. Really, I hate the web sometimes. There we go. Deployment to prod will start when it is manually triggered using the deploy action. And if we come over here, I hit deploy, I can come over and see and notice that work item there. This is what I mean about MTTD and MTTR. If, God forbid, something goes wrong with this deployment, the goal is not to point fingers. The goal is to find out why so we can fix it. Well, if you're practicing CI and CD this way, and we throw a little bit of traceability on there, we'll know that ah, the reason we did a deployment was because of this work item. And this work item is, as you're going to see, going to be linked. Oh, it's all done. So great. To this particular work item, the most recent change set was 53. And if I go to 53, it'll take me directly to the code that changed. Right? By so actually condensing down and moving faster, we can actually be safer. Because if something goes wrong, it's going to be a lot easier to find the problem, fix, and roll forward with it, okay? So in two or three minutes, I took a change and pushed it all the way to prod without doing anything manually. Sweet. Okay, anybody like the cloud, Azure? A few, oh, okay. So did anybody do the survey, by the way? I haven't had a chance to look. A couple of you, okay. So... Uh, so a lot of you are on-prem. So this will work in and on-prem. Now let's reverse that backwards item and show you how this got set up. So if we go look at the release definition, and we go to edit it, what we'll see is I have three environments defined. Now you have the choice when working with release management to define a pipeline set of environments. So in this case, dev feeds test, test goes on to prod. Or you can have scattershot environments where sometimes you update this environment, sometimes this one, okay? Whatever works for you. You don't have to have a, a pipeline. In either case, this one's meant to be simple enough to demonstrate that we can update the database automatically. So I'm using the WinRM SQL Server deployment task. When you set up a build, you can come over here and say add tasks, and you have a rich set of items to pick from, and one of them is the SQL Server one, okay? Once you have that task added, then it's a matter of filling in some of the data. So I've set I'm going to deploy using a DAC pack. The first thing to note is what machine I'm deploying to. Right? This can be a single machine. It can be multiple machines. So if you have a team of developers and you want to update all their private copies, you could do that with one task. You can use this with variables, or you can hard code like I've done here. The next thing is what is the admin login when talking to those machines? Naturally, if you're in a domain environment, this is where you set up service accounts, right? We shouldn't be having humans have accounts to do this. And then you'll notice the password is dollar sign build pass. 
So that is a variable that I've defined within the release. And you'll notice it's marked as star star, which means you can't see it because I've used the padlock. If I unpadlock it, it'll erase it, and you'll have to put it back in. If that's not good enough for you, you can leverage external technologies uh, for storing secrets and then get them as part of the release process initially. If you're working with Azure, you can use Azure Key Vault. Um, in fact, Microsoft is pushing out an update over the next three weeks right now that includes a custom uh, Key Vault task built into VSTS for you. So once I do that, the next step is how am I doing the deployment? So you have a choice here. You can do a SQL DAC pack, or as I mentioned, you could instead use a query file or inline SQL. You're demented and sad if you're using inline SQL for a full database deployment, so go home. Um, I don't personally like SQL query files because then you get it with this monster file, but some DBAs prefer that, okay, instead of DAC packs. Um, and one of the useful things about that is it's one way you can mitigate problems with databases that use replication since SSDT doesn't directly support uh, replication. Now, the next step is the DAC pack file. Well, this is coming from my build output, and I'll show you where that comes from in a second. Then specify what you're connecting to, and notice there's the name of my database. However, if you have tons of database servers and you want it to be able to change the names and want flexibility, one of the things you can do with SSDT is you can define a published profile, as well as you can pass dynamic arguments as part of the publishing process. So you can either do it here, always do the same database, or you can provide profiles that come from your code. Say, for example, you're using lots of branches, and so you want a different database name per branch. You can do that with profiles. And, of course, you can just come in here and pass arguments that come from variables that your release knows how to get. So lots of power there. And then the rest of it is just control flow if something goes wrong. And then whether or not you want to deploy in parallel. And this checkbox here affects further up here specifically. Whoops, hold on. So scroll, there we go. Oh, too far down. I want bigger resolution, 4K for the win. Right here, the machines. If you specify multiple machines and you've enabled deploy in parallel, it will then fan out um, automatically for you. All right? So the only thing that I don't like about this task is that it uses WinRM. And that means in order to use it, you should have a good network topology set up, and it prefers domain environments. Okay? I'm using it in a work group, it works fine, except I had to do a little extra work to set up the HTTPS certificate, right? Good, high-functioning DevOps organizations think about security. That means you should have some key authority you're working with, either a public one that you buy search from or probably your own, okay? And you're using good domain policies. If you do that, WinRM is not that bad. Where it gets kind of painful is when you have to deal with self-signed certs, God forbid, because you really shouldn't be using self-signed certs when, uh, if you can avoid it. Um, you want something that you can easily revoke um, as opposed to getting on machines and revoking them. The other thing is um, WinRM. Oh, the reason you might run into this domain environment is that you have certain setups where you have dev separated from prod or you have DMZs or environments that are not filling the domain. That's where it can get a little problematic. You've got to think, use things like shadow accounts, et cetera. Those are some of the more painful issues. Now, the nice thing about this, once you get dev set up, you can clone, and clone will make a copy of the environment. When you do that, you can specify whether you want to auto-trigger or specify users. Hit create. It'll show up here, and you can go for broke there. Let's we'll get rid of that. Now, test was just a copy, and the big change there was that I added a new database, or a new table. Yeah a new database name, and then I did the same thing for prod. Other than that, they used a similar format. That's the key thing. I'm using the same definition to update dev, test, and prod. Right? I'm not doing any, oh, wait, let's go make some tweaks to the files. Let's adjust. We want each environment to be matching as it goes through the pipeline. Now, like I said, prod you might want to think about, maybe we can't do it right away because we need to do a full backup. Right? It's, it's that time and maybe the database has to be a terabyte in size. Okay, so you might want to get the updates, you're ready to go, okay, wait for the backup to complete, and then when you're ready, someone can come in here and approve this. 
Well, the way we're able to do that is we can come over and assign approvers. And I must have done the other one. Did I do the other one? Oh, hold on. Did I not say my approvers? I guess I didn't. I must not. I, I didn't. I didn't save the change. So what I did is I made it manual, but I didn't assign the approvers. So I could say specific user, and then I could put a particular person in here. I'm the only one in the system. I don't have Mickey up here or anybody else or Wooter to help me, so I, I'm the only one who could have approved it anyway. But the point is you can set a gr security group or a user as the one who has to sign off. Uh, in addition, you can send them an email notification to say, hey, I need you to do that. Another good one is you can prevent the person that created the release from being the one who approves the deployment, right? So you can have the separation of, of duties, uh, which is often important when we're separating dev from prod, right? But now we've got something that's repeatable, and we have that full traceability so we can reduce that failure time if it happens. And guaranteed, you'll screw up. We don't want to, but something bad will happen, and we'll want to fix it. And this is how you can really micromanage that. All right, so now, how did this get kicked off? Well, we went in, and we had a build. So let's go back over to build. If I go to build DB, go to edit, the way this is set up is it's actually just a regular Visual Studio build. There isn't a particular build template that matches for SSDT projects. So the nice thing about this, you can build your website and your database together if it's relatively small, or you can have a dedicated project. Whether or not you have a dedicated project goes into the complexity scale of your applications. Do you have a one-to-one -one mapping between the app and the database? Or is the database a central hub for hundreds of microservices or applications? Right? My simple approach is this. If the database is mapped one-to-one, -one, then we can keep them together. If the database is shared, then it has to have its own management team, its own project. It has to have change management and tracking and coordination so that we don't break people. We're going to talk about app updates in just a bit. So we notice we do a standard NuGet restore. We build a solution. And then we have the test assemblies that are set up. The key thing I'll tell you about using the test assemblies with 2017 is knowing which version you're on. If you're on update 1, you're actually going to use the, you have version 1 of this task available. And one of the things you have to do is you have to come down here, and I'm going to switch it to version 1. And you have to come down to the advanced options and pick latest if you're using Visual Studio 2017. Otherwise, your test will blow up because it can't find the test runner. The thing is they made a change in update um, 2 so that you really want to pick up this new version of the task. And then it knows about 2017 right away. Okay, And then the last bit is we copy the output into an artifacts folder that we then publish up to the server. If you're on-premises with TFS, you can basically store the output inside your TFS box. Or if you're used to using a UNC drop share, you can continue to do that. The point is, wherever you publish it, this gets registered as an artifact source for your release. And so the release is going to pull the items out there. And what you care about is that when you do a build, and we're going to discard our changes. Oh, one last thing real quick. I have a continuous integration trigger set up here. OK, right there. And I've just set for the entire path. Obviously, if you have lots of projects, you're going to narrow it down based upon how you do uh, check-ins or commits if you're using Git. So now let's go back out to our list of builds go to the build report, and what you look at is we have an artifacts tab, and this artifacts tab shows you the drop, and you can download it as a zip, or if it's online like this, you can just come in here and explore, and what you'll see is a traditional folder structure, and under the database, there is my DAC pack. Okay? And if you ever looked at a DAC pack at the end of the day, it's an overglorified zip file with all the magic incantations inside there. All right? And then last but not least, as we mentioned, I had my work item here. And that work item gives us that traceability. The product backup item should define the business case. So why do we make a date change to the database? Obviously, the tasks are going to represent the developer that did it, why they did it, any notes. 
And this should link both directions, right? Should give us the information about the change set. And we can come over here, take a look at the flow. And finally, we can go to the code and look at the change set. So that's end to end, a release pipeline, make the change and go. Now, one thing about testing, the test projects do work great. However, some people want to do a little more and want to, um, it's, unfortunately, the heritage of the tools is that it was def defined back in 2006. And while they've gotten some enhancements, not a lot of love. Where a lot of the SQL community has moved to when it comes to doing database unit tests is using uh, T-SQL T. And the Redgate team has taken that on. And they, there's a free version available, as well as they provide tooling around it to make it richer. So that's one of the places where Redgate can give you some extra sugar there. In addition, along the entire pipeline, if you do buy into using Redgate's tools, whether it be um, things like T-SQL T, the continuous integration tools, or ReadyRoll, they have custom tasks that work in both TFS and VSTS to do this pipeline deployment stuff. Okay? Now, let's look at VSTS. So let's come over here, and we will get rid of this. We'll leave that. There we go. Get rid of these. Now, we're going to go out of here. So I have a database. In this case, we have the AdventureWorks database. Uh, this is the AdventureWorks Lite. Um, so it's a little bigger, et cetera. And this one, I decided to deploy to Azure. Now, the way I did this, of course, is number one, I have an Azure subscription. And I'm in the wrong browser. Let's go there. There we go. I'll log in. I've got issues. <laughs> Which Brian am I going to be today? All right. So in modern Azure, you want to put things in what are known as resource groups. And in my resource group, I have, whoops, let's go to D, Util, there we go, get a little zoom it. You'll see I have an SQL server instance, bar SQL West Europe, and then there's my two databases, okay, LT and Dev. All right. Now, similar setup to what we had on-prem. I have a database. This time I'm using Git, and you see... I've got a project here as well. And in fact, if we come down here and go to Visual Studio, you'll see I have it here as well. There we go. So it's a very similar setup. This one, I think I just have the database. Um, I don't think I wrote any unit tests yet. Give it a second. Yep, so there's the database. Now, one of the key things when deploying to Azure when using the SSDT tools is that you need to come into the project properties and make sure you set the appropriate target platform. Okay? So I'm using the latest version, so it's going to be the Microsoft Azure SQL Database V12. Once you've set that, everything else should work just fine and dandy. Then what we have, just like before, I have a build, and there's nothing different in the build from the one I just showed you in TFS. So that's very nice. They're the same setup. Supports unit tests, et cetera, right? So I've got this in here. And if we look at the definition, uh, let's go over here, edit. Now, one thing that you might see a little difference is the, um, the UI changes. The cloud's going to be ahead of me a little, but basically same type of setup. Then come over here to releases. Now, releases work exactly the same way uh, conceptually with some subtle mechanical differences. Um, the one thing to be aware of is the cloud today has the new version of the editor, so the UI is going to look a little different, but conceptually the same thing. 
you notice I have in the input here is Azure AdventureWorks. So this is telling me that we're coming from this build definition here. So that's where you get your assets from. And then if we come over here, we have a dev environment. And in the dev environment, instead of using the WinRM version, we use the Azure SQL deployment. Now, since we're using Azure, that means we have to add some data related to where the database is stored. So we tell it I'm using the Azure Resource Manager version. Footnote, it still does support classic deployments if you've got an existing deployment that's been around for a while. But naturally, Microsoft, like, any, like other things, wants you to move to the latest version. And then once it finishes loading, it'll show my subscription. Go down a little further, my database server, database name, login. And once again, notice I've masked the password and put it in a secure variable. And then I've told it that I'm deploying a, a DAC pack file. Now, the nice thing about this task, it's been enhanced over the WinRM one in that you can actually browse through your linked artifact to get to the DAC pack. So it's able to navigate just like we did with build. Unfortunately, the on-prem version today doesn't have the picker. You have to go figure out the path uh, manually. But this, that will be updated hopefully real soon now. But in either case, there's the DAC pack. So I was able to pick that. And you can also come in here and adjust the fi uh, firewall rules if necessary. The reason you might have to adjust the firewall, firewall rules is because if you're using the hosted agent up in the cloud, life is good. Because when you deploy and set up your server, you can say trust Azure services, and that means VSTS agents will work fine. In addition, your private agents, if running inside an Azure data center on an um, Azure subnet, it will also work. The problem you'll run into is if you're using a hosted agent on your network and you want to talk to the cloud, you have to trust your IP addresses uh, coming up through the firewall. And that's it. Once you've done that, it'll deploy. So one of these we could do here is we could say, you know what? I would like to clone this environment. And I'm going to call this test. And I can come in here to the task. We'll change that name. And we're going to save this. Click OK. And then I can come in and deploy that. So just because I want you to believe it's real, we'll create a release. We'll let this run. But otherwise, this is just like on-prem, conceptually, all right, with just a, some subtle mechanics. Now, we'll let that run. We'll come back and check it. I've put a bunch of screenshots in here just to make it easy for you to kind of, if you want to start poking around um, and they haven't posted the video, you can go through. But basically, what a build definition looks like, some basic settings you want to look at how to find the management task, various settings you want to be aware of. Um, oh, one thing I haven't mentioned. In order to have your build work successfully, the agent that does the building as well as does the deployments has to have the right tools. In the case of building up in the cloud, if I'm building on VS 2017, I want to use the hosted 20, uh, 2017 build agent. Works great. However, if you want to deploy, use the hosted one, the non-2017. Why? Because you won't find this demand, in other words, a rule, something the agent has to have on it for it to work. Okay? So when you go into your agents, you can look at the capabilities. This has to be there. SQL package needs to be there to use the DAC pack deployment model. All right? And here's some details with Azure. Set your subscription. In order to use an Azure subscription, you have to have a service endpoint. So Whoever creates the connection has to have the appropriate rights to the sub. Now, issues. Here's the big one that I get all the time. Brian, we need to update the database, and we also have to update the application. We want to do it at the same time. OK. You have two approaches. The bottom line is you have to build in compatibility to one of them. The general consensus is the first sub bullet point is the way to go. Deploy your application update first, and your application has to be resilient in the face of your current database and the next version of the database, right? You can do it the other way around, but that tends to be more complex. So what we like to do is push out the app updates. Oftentimes, depending on the scale of the service, you might want to even let it bake for a while. In other words, let it cook. Is the app still working good? Right? Otherwise, we can roll back to the previous version. And the previous version of the app, because the database didn't change, will continue to work, and everybody's happy. 
Then, once you sign off, things look good. Then roll forward, the database changes, and the app should not miss a beat because the app is going to be tested against the new version of the database as well. All right? Drift. This is the horrible thing. You go to the trouble to get a copy of the database. You have it in there in SSDT. Your life is good. You're doing deployments. And then it blows up when it tries to deploy and says, yeah, the models don't match. I can't figure this out. And that's because the DBA has been in there making changes in SSMS. Anybody have a DDR like that? Yeah. Redgate has a tool called DLM Dashboard that will help you monitor it, and it's free. It can help you monitor database drift. Take a look at that. Data motion. SSDT out of the box does not do data motion. What that means is if you are changing the database uh, format, the catalog, the tables, in a way that would cause data loss, by default it blocks. You will need to handle that in your pre-deployment and post-deployment scripts if you want to do things like the most canonical ones. Someone creates a name column and you want to split it into first name and last name. Okay? SST doesn't do that. Static data loading and test data. Static data loading, easiest way to do it with SSDT is to put it as a post-deployment script that updates, you know, combo box data, uh, country codes, postal codes, that kind of stuff. Test data. Uh, this is more complex, requires its own session, but the bottom line is be careful what you do. You guys are in Europe, you know what 2018 brings uh, as far as privacy rules. Redgate's out there to help you with a tool called SQL Clone. It's not cheap, but it's awesome. Um, they also have a data masking tool which can help you basically take some data from prod and put it into test, but you're on your own on that. Microsoft's not doing a lot of lo love for you there. It's all manual. Last thing is replication. SSDT does not work with replication. Sorry. And it's been that way, unfortunately, forever. All right. One final thought because I'm out of time. Don't let the gray hairs uh, be an impediment. Be willing to learn. Be willing to change. Take control. Bring DLM to your database. Don't let Dieter ruin the world. Contact me on Twitter, email, go to my blog. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming to my session and enjoy the rest of Tech Days. Have a great day.